Here we go. Here comes the Sandman. Ladies and gentlemen. Adam Sandler. One, two, three, four. The I Missed You Tour. Should we clap along? Trying to play guitar a little bit for you. Adam Sandler. Live. Take him away. Ford Idaho Center Arena, October 15th. All right, let's lose that. I hate it. Get tickets now at FordIdahoCenter.com. <laughs> Today on CityCast Boise, election season is in full swing this week. Boise State Public Radio's George Prentice joins me to break down the latest back and forth between Boise's mayoral candidates and which city council races have our attention. Plus, we take a break from politics to talk about our favorite time of the year, movie season. It's Friday, October 6th. I'm Blake Hunter in for Emma Arnold, and this is what Boise's talking about. All right, good morning, George. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm well, Blake. Good morning. Okay, so we're we're doing this a little bit differently this week. We're recording on a Wednesday. I just want let, to let listeners know that because we've got we both got the mayoral forums tomorrow that we're going to, uh, and so the the week schedule is just a little wonky. Um, but we are going to talk about mayoral stuff because this this email that I want to talk about from uh, Masterson Mike Masterson's campaign uh, is a week old at this point. But we have you on the podcast, so I just have to ask you. Um, about this email. So Emma and I touched on it earlier this week, but it, it came from former uh, city council member and legislator, uh, Marianne Jordan and former mayor, Dave Beter. Uh, and I just want to read this little excerpt. Um, Mike earned all of our support because this is a race about values and outcomes. Mayor McLean ran for mayor four years ago, promising transparency, collaboration and effective government, but she has not delivered. So George, just tell me what was your what was your reaction when you first read this? What were you thinking? Well, uh, you can imagine it's it's a little bit like three D chess for me because I know all of the players and I've yeah. talked to them for years. So the first thing I'm going to do when I find that in my inbox is like, who authored this? Well, Dave Beater, Lauren McLean beat Dave Beater, uh, and she defied expectation. She beat him uh in a runoff election no doubt right and so i think it's after you know he had served i don't know how many terms in office and uh so is the taste in his mouth that much bitter yeah i don't think it has subsided marianne jordan i think it's fair to say also comes from that camp if you will so what is that camp that camp is for lack of a better phrase old school so we need to take that into account Mike Masterson was appointed by Dave Beter, and Marion Jordan was leadership on council uh, for Mike Masterson. Uh, that's not a fault of theirs or his. That said, right. you can connect those dots pretty readily. But when they say, quote, uh, Mike is the choice of unions, business, and nonprofit leaders, well, I think we could also find unions, uh, nonprofit leaders, and businesses that also support uh, Lauren McLean. Right. Uh, but <laughs> I think the thing that jumped out for me was when they declare that uh, Mayor McLean has run the city with what, in their words, insular, often petty administration. I think any challenger could say that about anyone else. Uh, uh, certainly an incumbent, uh, because you're you're bound to tick people off. Um, so, uh, yeah. Was it a huge surprise? No. Uh, is it? Uh, did it go out to people who pro who might vote for Mike Masterson already? Probably. Uh, did it sway anyone? I, I doubt it. That makes sense. Another thing that I think stood out to me about this email was that it felt like a level up. It, it felt like you know one of the biggest moments of of the election campaign so far, as far as just like oh, shots are really being fired, like more voices are wear, weighing in. And, you know, of course, Marianne Jordan's uh, been a part of Masterson's campaign for a while, so she's not mm -hmm. necessarily new. But, um, yeah, it felt like they kind of upped the ante a little bit. Um, and that makes me think that we're having to go to those because we've had so few mayoral forums and mayoral debates this year. Can you tell me about that? What's 
Do you know what's going on there? Why is that happening? I think the answer is actually in your question, and that is that this is a rare moment where I don't know if any of us could predict the actual tally of what's going to happen on election night. Mm -hmm. I think Mike Masterson is going to give Lauren McLean a pretty good run for her money. Um, and money is, is the key there. Um, yeah. So you have union money, uh, really strong unions, fire and police unions backing Mike Masterson. But then you've got unions also backing Lauren McLean. But then there's the outside money, right? And the builders group. And then some of the uh, emails that are being pushed out lately are so uh, caustic that Mike Masterson has had to distance him, himself right. from, from them. So where are we going? It, we're, we're, if we're not there already, we are in an ugly campaign. We're in a pretty ugly campaign. And the last ugly campaign in the city of Boise blew up in Dave Beter's face. In the runoff election, uh, when, and keep in mind, it, it's in the city of Boise, you've got to get 50% plus one to be the winner. But because there were multiple candidates, uh, some of which were interesting, including a former mayor, Brent Coles, in the last general election, Dave Beter and Lauren McLean had to face off each other again in December. And in that window of opportunity, uh, there, were, there were ads that declared Lauren McLean to be socialist, that the city of Boise would become a tent city for the homeless, et cetera. And they were uh, pretty uh, caustic as well. That blew up yeah. in uh, Dave Beter's face. So... While caustic politics may be the norm on the national level, I'm not sure if they work for anyone at a municipal level, and in particular in the city of Boise. Yeah, and I, I want to just let listeners know. So uh, what George just mentioned there about Masterson having to kind of distance himself is this week for the second time in, in the past month, um, he has had to kind of speak out against, make public comments against some homophobic messaging that has been in support of him. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, back in Pride Month, there was the plane uh, that flew over Pride, uh, the Boise Pride Festival um, with a homophobic message. Uh, and that the person who was operating that had donated to Masterson and he had to return that money or he decided to return that money. Um, and then this week, um, a development pack uh, ran some ads kind of, you know, calling La uh, Lauren McLean an extremist socialist. Um, racist. Racist as in she, they, they, cl they claimed that she had dubbed the police department, uh, the, the uh, rank and file on the police force to be racist at the height of that scandal. But what, what Masterson had to walk back particular, or not walk back, but spoke out against in particular, was this photo of McLean, uh, you know, walking in the Pride Parade and calling her an extremist, extreme socialist. And uh, he had to speak out and say, you know, I don't endorse that. I um, have been proud to serve next to LGBTQ officers and work with the LGBT community um, for years. And, you know, I think it's really interesting that that's the second time that he's had to uh, speak out and say, this is not what I'm trying to run on. And if I may, uh, there is a really ugly logic in sending out emails like this that include uh, words that end with the letters IST, IST. Whether they are true or not, it triggers reporters to repeat those claims, mm -hmm. uh, but also to uh, get comments to, to counter those claims. That said, it elevates right. uh, that ugliness. And so I, I caution, so I'm old enough to, to have learned that lesson. <laughs> so I caution my brethren uh, in, in my profession to be very careful about what you repeat, especially in things that are just incredibly ugly and that you know aren't true. Um, just to say, well, I'm just reporting the news and I, and I got the counter argument. Well, all of a sudden you have elevated that conversation. Well, yeah, so we've we've got the mayoral stuff. We're going to be talking about that the next few weeks before the election. But let's jump into city council races. So I did kind of a whole rundown of everybody who's running right now and, and some some notes that I thought were, you know, important for people to keep in mind, uh, just weighing these candidates. Uh, and I asked you to each. Well, each of us kind of picked one district to focus on and talk about. You picked District 2. Tell me about that. 
Well, District 2, and again, just as a reminder, we are voting per district, right? Right. The legislature has forced this upon cities of a certain size, Boise in particular, Meridian and Nampa, um, to vote by district. Why did the legislature do that, by the way? The legislature did that because they a, a fair amount of the uh, majority doesn't like Boise yeah. and doesn't like uh, Boise being left of center. And by redistricting, uh, it tries to uh, elevate, if you will, uh, the power um, by pushing more representation from communities west of downtown. Right. So District 2, uh, that is the northern sections of the bench and part of West Boise. Mm -hmm. The incumbent is Colin Nash. To a, a lot of people may say, oh, I'm sorry, who, who's Colin Nash? Well, he hasn't been on the council that long. In fact, he hasn't been in the Idaho legislature that long. Uh, he is, yes, a member of the legislature. He was appointed by the mayor earlier this year. Uh, to fill one of two vacancies. Uh, so he's decided to try to keep that seat on the council. And if he is successful, he says, I'll step away from the legislature. So here's Colin Nash, who I think it's fair to say echoes much of the mayor's agenda. Uh, he will probably tell us that he is his own person, and that's not to say he's not. That said, his yes votes, uh, more often than not, echo what the administration, uh, or at least the view of the city of the administration. She picked him for a reason, right? Yeah. Yes, indeed. He has been picked by by, by Lauren McLean. So his challengers include another former uh, member of the legislature, Grant Burgoyne, uh, a state senator who represented a section of Boise for years. And by the way, when he left the legislature, mm -hmm. he's 68. Here's a quote of when he left the legislature. <laughs> I pretty strongly believe that we all ought to be looking at turning things over to the younger generations. That's interesting. Yeah. This is when he stepped away from the legislature, right? So I'm not saying, well, I am saying that I think if you were to look up the definition of career politician and somebody who just really loves the action, if you will, I think Grant Burgoyne might qualify for that. That's not to say that he's not... Uh, uh, wouldn't make a, a good uh, council member for him to say, oh, I think, you know, younger folks probably ought to do this. And yet, you know, here he is back again uh, a, a year after he stepped away from the state legislature to say, oh, now I want to be on the city council. So he is a candidate in District 2. And and George, would I be right in maybe saying so he's spoken out against the zoning code rewrite or at least parts of it, yep. whereas Nash, you know, obviously voted for it while he was on the council. Would I be right in saying that maybe, you know, Burgoyne falls into the camp of Marianne Jordan and Dave Beter in, in this in this election? Yes. And I, well, I don't know if he would. Uh, I think he'd be mm. quick to <laughs> correct us, but I think he'd be correct, uh, quick to correct us on just about everything. Uh, which is to say that finger wagging old man, old white man <laughs> thing that I'm that I'm so good at being a very old white man. Um, but I what I find interesting is Grant Burgoyne uh, adamantly opposing uh, interfaith sanctuaries transfer to their new location on State Street. And he said that the city should instead use its resources to partner uh, with uh, other folks to establish a network of shelters. Uh, smaller shelters across the city. Last time I checked, I don't think there's a long line of people no. or nonprofits <laughs> who say, oh, yeah, let's do this. The nonprofits do the heavy lifting. The city is not in the business of, of operating or owning homeless shelters. They did that once, a community house. It was a disaster. It ended up in federal court. Uh, so that as an argument is interesting. It's like, well, yeah. and, and who who is lining up to do that? Because interfaith, actually, they're the ones carrying the heavy water, whether you agree or disagree with, with them. Another uh, challenger in District 2 is Hillary Smith. I think it, uh, she uh, would agree that uh, if we were to call her right of center, I think that uh, she would tell us uh, that that's probably true. Uh, she was asked by BoiseDev.com if the city should support Boise Pride. Her response was no comment. Right. Uh, so I think that uh, is is very interesting. So Hillary Smith is there as well. So uh, District Two, I think, is really interesting uh, as far as the the uh, the folks on the on the ballot. Yeah, and I'm interested to see. You know, obviously, uh, District One is the majority of West Boise over there, and Lucy Willits uh, is an incumbent, and she's uh, immediately got her position because she was running unopposed. 
But I'm interested to see, I mean, I think that we'll, we're about to learn a lot about the demographics of West Boise and how, how, how much of that reaches into, yeah, the West Bench, North Bench, uh, Winstead Park area. Hillary Smith and Lucy Willits uh, have been appearing in Meet the Candidate events together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and supporting yeah, Masterson. As a matter of fact, Masterson has also appeared at those same events. So, yeah. Uh, and I also want to mention uh, Jesse Gonzalez um, is a former Forest Service, Service smoke jumper uh, entrepreneur in that race as well. But I haven't been able to find a campaign website for him. But proud grandpa, he uh, likes to tell people that he's helping to raise uh, three of his grandkids. Uh, also an older gentleman, uh, but great uh, volunteerism on his uh, CV. And uh, but uh, another alternative. There are four folks running in this district. Yeah, and another another district where we have four folks running, which I'm, I've got my eye on, is District Three. So, uh, just kind of south um, of District Two, there uh, we're talking about like south, some Southwest Boise and some of the Central Bench. Uh, right now, Latonia Haney Keith is in this seat or in the third seat, uh, and she was appointed earlier this year, but she's not running. Uh, but it's it's still like a pretty a pretty packed race. So we've got. Chris Blanchard, who's a member of the city's planning and zoning commission, uh, Kathy Corliss, who's a former president of the South Coal Neighborhood Association, Josh Johnston, who's a VP of a tech company in downtown Bo Boise Count, uh, and then Teresa Vodder, an Idaho Food Bank staff member. Um, and you know, I've got to say, they've all got pretty impressive resumes, really, as far as uh, corporate experience specifically. Uh, I think that most of them have some. But you do have some interesting divides as far as, you know, Teresa Vodder has spoken, uh, spoke to Boise Dev again, actually, about her support of the city's investigation into racism at BPD, which we're coming up on a year ago now. Um, while, as you know, Johnston said that he did not, uh, I think it's fair to say that Johnston is maybe a little bit more on the right here. He is a registered Republican. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, but Blanchard at the same time, you know, being on this city's planning and zoning commission, you've got to think that that at least gives him a leg up with people at City Hall. Uh, so I'm interested to see what voters think of him. Um, and yeah, th this is an interesting race. Uh, I was just kind of looking at the their campaign donations so far uh, this year, which I, you know, they don't tell the whole story, but they do tell a story. Uh, Teresa Vodder has raised about eight thousand uh, dollars in donations this year. Uh, Chris Blanchard is just over three thousand. Kathy Corliss is just under two thousand. Josh Johnson has actually raised, or well, has twenty six thousand uh, dollars, but eighteen thousand dollars of those uh, he loaned to himself. That's a lot of mailers. It is a lot. I, I'm wondering, I mean, like, am I going to start seeing YouTube ads for him as well, you know, or or, or just where he's going to be spending that money. So and we expect those numbers to go up, obviously, in the next few months. And yeah, I mean, I w I've kind of expected, you know, at, at this point, maybe somebody to drop out of this race. But we've got four pretty solid contenders, I feel like here. What What's your read on this district? My read on it, by the way, I, I, I'm always intrigued when someone has some experience on P&Z or yeah. design review on those. Now, that's where we get wonky, right? That said, that's where the rubber meets the road in municipal government. Absolutely. Is not ribbon cutting. It's not in tree planting. It's in wonky stuff. So P&Z commission, yeah, that matters uh, certainly to people at City Hall. But uh, but yeah, as far as qualifications, those are really interesting. But where do I think most voters are? I think to your point is where do I lean with those nonprofits, right? Because that will probably decide whether someone supports that candidate or not, that candidate being aligned with a particular nonprofit that I support, that I think uh, needs to be elevated, et cetera. I think those qualifications will sway the vote. Yeah, absolutely. I am Tyler Childers, live in concert. The Mule Pole 24 Tour. Ford Idaho Center Amphitheater, August 21st. With special guests, Shaky Graves. Get tickets this Friday at 10 a.m. at FordIdahoCenter.com. The new album, Rustin' in the Rain, is available everywhere now. Visit TylerChildersMusic.com.
I want to talk to you about this recent interview that you did with uh, Kim Cross, who's an Idaho-based journalist and author. She's uh, really done some some deep, detailed historical work. I was I was looking into her after your interview with her, um, and she but she just recently wrote a book for her first time dipping into the waters of true crime, which I was a little bit apprehensive about as well, uh, but we can kind of get into that. But she just wrote a book um, talking about the aftermath of um, the murder of Polly Kloss, who was a 12-year-old girl who uh, just this month or this week actually was the 30th anniversary um, of her kidnapping um, in California. And it I mean, made a lot of headlines. And she, so she wrote this book called In Light of All Darkness. It comes out this week. Talk to me. How, how was it speaking to Kim Cross this week? Well, I know Kim Cross as a consumer of her journalism. She is a journalist extraordinaire. And again, her uh, her uh, level of detail in her reporting is supreme. I'm right there with you on true crime. I am not a consumer of true crime. That said, Blake, we are in the minority. True crime yes. is not just a genre. It, 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 it sells. I mean, I've lost count of how many channels that do nothing but push out true crime, uh, nonfiction and fiction. But uh, so my first question was, OK, well, uh, why true crime? And and Kim Cross said, yeah, I'm, I, I don't lean toward true crime either. Uh, but it's very personal. Um, and the best example I can give you is that as she was interviewed, and by the way, or, or as she interviewed uh, folks for her book, she interviewed 24 FBI agents. That is unheard of. That is a lot. For FBI agents to agree to it in an interview, let alone go on the record, because if they agree, it's usually off the record or for deep background. So... At the end of one of her interviews with a group of agents, she asked the question, by the way, why did you agree to talk with me? And they said, because you're family. The bottom line is that Kim Cross's father-in-law uh, is Eddie Fryer Jr., who led the investigation into the abduction of Polly Kloss. Uh, those of us old enough to remember this case, remember that Polly Kloss's image was described as America's child. And this was before the abducted white woman syndrome had uh, right. taken over our airwaves and continue, by the way, to take over our airwaves. This was long before the countless abductions of, of children, in particular white children, that have filled our airwaves. So 30 years ago, taken at knife point from a slumber party, and, and the search for her went on for months. So while the story of Polly Kloss has been the subject of, I don't know how many podcasts and documentaries, et cetera, they usually cut to the chase. They usually fast forward through those months. In Kim's book, it's the detail of that investigation. How did they catch this killer long before the public even knew what CSI ever stood for? The forensics that we know today did not exist and in fact were developed in the polyclos investigation and case and how they caught polyclos's killer and by the way spoiler alert polyclos her body was discovered polyclos's killer by the way remains alive on california's death row uh, because california's put its uh, death penalty on um, pause that's a different uh, debate uh, I found myself highly emotional in reading this book. I power through. I've lo I, I power through books on a daily basis, uh, but uh, I openly cried on a number of occasions as I'm pouring through this really detailed, non-emotional book. Um, mostly because, Blake, I have to tell you that early in my career, I was at a lot of crime scenes uh, back in the day when they would allow reporters at this at at the scene before you know. Uh, they understood that that could contaminate evidence. That's not helpful. Yeah. So uh, so this uh, triggered a lot for me. So what I found with uh, Kim Cross was this fascinating detail of a journalist. But then I, I think I caught her a little off guard when I asked her about self-care. And I asked her about, oh, OK, well, how did you power through this? And she's like, and she openly says, I, I, I wrote through my tears. I wrote through my insomnia. And, and how to this day she has to, her, her uh, getting on her mountain bike and, and riding into the Boise foothills is absolutely important to her for her self-care. 
she sent me a uh, an email uh, the other day when our interview aired, and she said, I'm off on my bike right now. I just want to thank you, et cetera. And she said, and thank you for asking me about self-care. And yeah. uh, so uh, I, I don't uh, hawk books for a living, but this one's called In Light of All Darkness. And uh, if you like really good journalism, true crime or not, it's pretty superb. I'm excited to get my hands on this one. Yeah, I, I have a hard time with true crime, kind of all like the normal discourse that we have about it. But it's so exploitive. It, it can, in a heartbeat, it can be very exploitive. Yeah, but I mean, it is so as far as her talking about uh, the development of the forensic investigation and and also just, you know, the social side of the policies of how how we treat huge stories like this is a huge part of our culture. So, yeah, I'm excited to get my hands on that. I want to turn now our attention to we are soon moving into movie season. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the awards picks are or at least uh, soon to be nominations will be rolling out. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. I have one movie that I especially have my eyes on right now. Um, it's called All of Us Strangers. Uh, this is from mm-hmm. British filmmaker uh, Andrew High. I, I'm excited about this for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a uh, a romantic fantasy is what it's being kind of called, which is not not usually my my genre. But m- the thing that I'm most excited about is is the cast. It's starring Andrew Scott and Paul Meskel. Um, so if you've seen Fleabag and or Normal People, respectively, two of my favorite television shows uh, that have been made in the last few years, especially Fleabag, uh, that Andrew Scott starred in the second season of. Um, they are going to be in it, and they are, they are kind of the two romantic interests here. And I've got to tell it's I just immediately know that it's going to be incredible because everything that I've seen either of them in have they're just such powerhouses and such th- just the emotion that they convey so just so readily. Um, it seems I I'm so excited about this one. It comes out right before Christmas, uh, so I, I can't wait. What are your picks? Well, you're spot on with that, by the way, because I'm lucky enough that I get an opportunity to sit down with uh, the owner of the Flicks in Boise and actually look at the schedule or what she's thinking about slotting. Right. And yeah, that's going to land right in that sweet spot of what we, we yes, it is. now known as award season. So yeah, that was a, uh, uh, that exploded uh, out of the festival, uh, early festival scene. Uh, so I have to tell you that I have seen uh Killers of the Flower Moon, um, Martin Scorsese's uh, oh, okay. new American epic. Um, I saw it in a private screening. Uh, so there were uh, just, a, I think, about 15 of us in the room. Um, and I was told I couldn't write about it until a, a <laughs> date in the future. And by the way, that date is coming very closely. So it's going to open on October 20th. Um, it is an epic. And indeed, it is uh, about the, the Osage murders. Uh, it tells uh, the story of how in the 1920s, white Oklahoma businessmen plotted to steal the wealth of the Osage Native American tribe. And they did that by either murdering members of the tribe, marrying members of the tribe, and then killing their spouses. So, I mean, it's 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 rather chilling. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is in it, and Robert De Niro, who plays a, a baron, and a, a bloodthirsty baron, who you will soon not forget. Martin Scorsese is uh, 80 now. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that he took this best-selling book, Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, which uh, it was uh, the white characters uh, were the the centerpiece of these stories. And he has um, he's rewritten this to make the centerpiece of the film one of the members of the tribe uh, who was married. And uh, so it's uh, it's pretty incredible uh, that uh, that this 80 year old Martin Scorsese uh, could push out. Uh, something this epic. And I, I'm, I'm usually the most skeptical person in the room when someone says, oh, no, no, this is Scorsese's uh, great, great <laughs> film. And it is, uh, it's jaw dropping. So, uh, so that's on my list. It's, it's going to come out uh, later this month. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's going to be a best picture nominee. I think it's just a matter of how many nominations. Uh, this picture will get. So it's great. Do you have one more for us? I do. Uh, and it's a, it's a documentary that also comes out on October 20th. 
and uh, it is called The Pigeon Tunnel. And uh, Academy Award winning uh, director Errol Morris, uh, who is probably the best American documentarian on the planet right now, uh, tells the storied career and life of David Cornwell. And if people say, I don't know who David Cornwell is, well, David Cornwell was, is Jean Le Carré. Uh, the greatest spy master, uh, real okay. life spy, and has written the definitive spy novels of all time. It is called The Pigeon Tunnel. It comes out on Apple TV, but it also opens at a theater <laughs> on October 20th. Ah. It is well worth seeing. If you love uh, spies, if you love really good documentaries, it is called The Pigeon Tunnel, and I highly recommend it. Interesting. Well, thank you for giving us on the scoops on everything from city elections to uh, movies. And I'll probably see you at the flicks this winter. But thank you for joining me, George. Count on it. Thank you, Blake. Thanks so very much. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. The show is produced by Evelyn Avitia, Grant Irving, A.K. Al Moomin, and Emma Arnold. I'm Blake Hunter, and I write our Hey Boise newsletter with the help of Natalia Aldana this week. Our music is by All the Kimonos and local band Up Is The Down Is The. If you enjoyed our show today, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. We'll be back on Tuesday after Indigenous Peoples Day with a deep dive into how Idaho's open primary ballot initiative came to be and how it would work. See you then.